So hash functions are used a lot in Bitcoin and blockchain. There's one other cryptographic primitive that's used as well, which is a digital signature. So to think about a digital signature, before we even, even think about a digital signature, we might think of just a normal signature, a handwritten signature. And pretend that, I don't know, say you're a celebrity soccer player and someone gives you a soccer ball. I'll do my best to draw a soccer ball and you know, you're going to sign it, okay? Um, let's think about the components of what went into this autograph, okay? Maybe later you're going to, the person you signed the ball for, they're going to try and sell it to someone else and they want to establish whether this is actually your signature or not. Um, so there's three basic components. You have the thing that's being signed. Uh, so in this case, it's a ball. Uh, it could be a letter, it could be a message, whatever, whatever that case is, okay? Um, the second is you have the signature itself. And the third thing that you have uh, that, that you don't often think about, uh, but is sort of what makes a handwritten signature have at least some level of security. It doesn't have very good security, but um, what you have is the person who signed it, they know how to make that signature. They, they you know, inside their brain or whatever, there's, they have some cognitive process that, that allows them to very quickly make that exact signature. And the idea is that if you try to make that signature as well, say you were trying to forge it, um, you couldn't do it. You know, you wouldn't, you don't have that, you haven't memorized that pattern well enough uh, that you can sign, you know, quick enough, maybe you'd be really slow, but then if you zoom in on the signature, you would see that it, the pen was dragged too slowly, that type of thing, okay? Um, so there's some secret, right? This is the secret that, that distinguishes. So this signature, you know that I signed it because um, this signature was created by my, my physique, my brain, my head, uh, because of some secret that's inside of me, okay? Uh, so there's a secret technique. Uh, that allows, you know, me to create that signature and not uh, somebody else, okay? Um, so those are the three components. Now, signatures are... Uh, handwritten signatures aren't super secure. Um, so th there's a few things that can go wrong. Uh, the first thing is someone can try and learn that same secret technique. Okay, so um, by examining the signature itself, right, you can try and reverse out what the secret technique is. So with the digital signature, this is going to be a digital kind of variant on this idea of a signature. But with the digital signature, what we're going to strive to do is we're going to make it so that it's uh, infeasible that if you see a signature, that you're able to find out what the, the sort of secret technique was to create that signature. Okay, the other thing is that when you sign a ball, um, you know, it, this is sort of a, a poor example maybe, but the ball doesn't actually, the ball could change. Someone could change that ball. And, and so when you see the signature on the ball, it's not necessarily the same ball that you signed, right? For example, they could, you know, cut something away from the ball. I don't know. It's it's not a good example with the ball, but let's think about a letter instead. So let's say that you sign a letter. Let's say it's like a four page letter and you sign the last page. Well, someone after can go and change what the first three pages say, right? Or if there's any white space that's left on the, on the letter on the fourth page that you actually signed, they could insert new text. Um, so your signature doesn't, it doesn't actually lock in the contents of what you're signing. So that's another thing that we're going to improve with a digital signature. So with the digital signature, we're going to use some techniques, some cryptographic techniques, so that um, when you actually sign something, uh, you're, you're kind of binding that signature to the actual message as it were, was signed. And if the message changes, then the signature is no longer valid. You would say, okay, well, maybe they signed something, but they didn't sign that particular message. Okay, so that's, that's sort of where we're going. Now, just, with, just like with hash functions, we're not gonna concern ourselves with the details of how they work on the inside. Um, so I'm just gonna show it to you like a black box. It's an algorithm, it's sitting on the table. We're not sure how it works inside, okay? Um, so let's think about though, if it, if it is an algorithm that's just sort of sitting on the table, what are its inputs, what are its outputs? What's the behavior that we expect from this particular algorithm? So the first thing that we have is we need to take this, this concept of a secret technique and we need to kind of formalize it. 
Uh, so the way we do it is we formalize it as a secret uh, key, which is really a, a random number that you choose. And it's quite large. Um, so uh, let's say it's, it's 256 bits. OK. And so the probability of any two people changing, choosing that exact same key is, is very low, right? It's uh, 1 over 2 to the 256, which is just an obscenely low number. Uh, basically, it won't happen. Um, it, it might happen if, if your random number generator is broken. And, and we'll circle back to that, because that's actually been problematic in Bitcoin. But um, if you're actually truly choosing a secret key at random, you're not, no two people are ever you know, in the lifetime of the universe going to pick the exact same key. Um, so it's 256 bits, and that's your secret, and you remember it. Uh, by remember it, I mean you're going to probably write it down, and by write it down, you're probably going to store it in a file that's on your computer. And we'll circle back to this issue as well, because how you deal with these keys is also uh, problematic. But for now, we'll assume that you have this secret key. Uh, your computer is at least remembering it uh, for you. And if I get a copy of your secret key, then I can go around and sign things as you. And if I don't know your secret key, then I can't sign things on your behalf. That's the basic security property. OK, now what we're going to do with the secret key is we're going to turn it into a kind of helper value, uh, something that's going to help us sign things. OK, uh, the thing uh, that that we're going to turn it into is called a public key. And you can think of a public key as kind of your identity. So your secret key is the secret and your public keys, the identity itself. The public key isn't the signature because you can sign different documents. So the signature will be specific to the documents. Uh, your public key is more like a fingerprint of who you are. Uh, and so it's also going to be a random looking number. I'm going to even put the word number in quotes. Uh, so um, for example, in Bitcoin's case, we'll, we'll get to this point, but it's, it's actually technically not a number. Um, but, but you can think of it as you know, in a lot of signature schemes, it's exactly a number. Sometimes it's a pair of numbers. Uh, sometimes it, it might be something more kind of exotic. Um, OK, so we have this public key, so it's some sort of number. Uh, we have a seeker key, uh, which is some sort of number. And what we have is an algorithm that generates the public key. So we call it key gen for key generation from the secret key. OK, and the basic property here is that this uh, function First off, it's it's um, let's let's just note some of the things uh, that we talked about with hash functions that also apply to this. Uh, this is a deterministic function. So every time you start with the same secret key, you'll get the same public key. Uh, it's a public function. There's nothing secret about this key generation. So you can read the algorithm. Okay, the only secret is the value that you put in. The input is your secret, and there's lots of different inputs. No one will ever choose the same one twice. Um, and uh, but otherwise, this algorithm is fully specified. OK, you can read about how it works. The final thing about this algorithm is it's a one way function or a one way algorithm, uh, meaning it should be hard to hard to invert. And by hard, we actually mean infeasible. Uh, so we'll circle back to the security properties. But this is just a, a just to get you thinking. Um, if you have a secret key, you can turn it into a public key. But if you have a public key, it should be hard to turn it back into a secret key. OK, um, so that's kind of like a hash function with the pre-image resistance uh, property, um, although it's, it's, it's slightly different uh, in this case. OK, so this is the key gen. So this is the first component of a digital signature. The second component of a digital signature is the actual signing itself. OK. So we're going to have a function. We'll call it sign. And what it's going to do is it's going to produce a signature. We'll denote it sigma. And this also will be a number or something, pair of numbers, something like that. Um, so I'll put number in quotes. And uh, it might be a, a set of numbers. Uh, it depends on the details of the signature scheme. Um, in, in the case of Bitcoin, uh, we'll get to the specifics of the signature scheme and, and what these numbers look like and how big they are and, and that type of thing. But 
uh, for now let's just think about inputs and outputs. So we have this signing algorithm. Uh, so we're going to have to take a few inputs. So the first thing is what it is that we actually want to sign. Uh, so this is usually denoted as the message. And the message can be any size. And uh, because this is a digital signature scheme, it has to be digital. Okay, so you can think of it as a stream of bits or a number, however you want to think of it. I usually think of it as, as kind of a, a stream of bits. Okay, um, so this is the message that you want to sign. And it, it can be very big, right? You could sign the contents of your entire hard drive, for example. Uh, and we'll talk about how we get it, uh, how, how the signature is able to take such a big input. Uh, in a second. Um, so that's the message. Now the next thing is I need to know that you're the person who signed it. Okay. And so how do I know the difference between you and somebody else? Well, everyone has this unique public key. That's what defines them. That's what makes them, that's what makes Alice different than Bob is Alice has one public key and Bob has another public key. So the signature algorithm um, is going to be or the signature itself is going to be tied to the person's public key. Okay. Now, if we use the public key as an input, um, that's fine. Uh, in fact, you can consider it an input. Um, but, but what we need to do is we need to use the secret key as the input because we want to make sure that the only person that can produce this signature uh, is the person that holds the secret key that corresponds uh, to this particular public key. Okay. Uh, and so if we want to say that this signature came from Alice and not from Bob, then there has to be something about Alice that Bob doesn't know that's being used to generate the signature. So that's precisely the secret key. That's, that's what ties it or binds this signature to the actual person uh, who's doing the signing itself. Okay, so we have a message, uh, we have a secret key. And finally, uh, once again, not every signature algorithm has it, but the ones that, that have uh, proper levels of security generally have it, um, is we usually take in some randomness. So we're going to generate some randomness at signature time. And the reason we do this is so that if you sit, sign the same message twice, you'll actually end up with a different signature. Your signature will look different. So uh, if you sign the same message 10 times, uh, you're going to get 10 different signatures that come out um, all of them will be a binding between this message and the public key that corresponds to the secret key. So the signature itself will have the same semantics. It will just, the actual number that is written down will look uh, different, okay? Um, and usually we, we don't actually put the randomness in when we talk about signatures. It's kind of a finesse that we don't think a lot about. Uh, but there is a problem with the exact signature algorithm that Bitcoin uses, where uh, if you accidentally sign two different messages with the same randomness, it actually leaks your secret key due to some of the mathematics that underlie the signature itself. So uh, I just want to get this randomness in here because eventually we're going to circle, circle back and talk about that particular attack. Uh, for now, though, we'll, we'll, we'll just leave it on the side. Um, okay, the signature function itself, what, what is it? So this is a, it's a deterministic function, meaning that uh, even though you sign the same message twice, you get a different signature, all that is coming from this randomness, okay? There's nothing in the signature algorithm itself that's, that's making it non-deterministic. In other words, if you showed up with the exact same message and secret key, and you use the same randomness, then you would get the exact same number out, okay? So every time you tweak the randomness, you're getting a different signature, but if you use the same randomness twice, you would actually get the same signature. Um, so the signature function itself is deterministic. Uh, it's publicly defined. Okay, so you can, there's no secret involved in the signature scheme itself. Uh, you can look up how it works. Um, and so, uh, in terms of Bitcoin, we're not going to get into the details, but I'll, I'll tell you what the algorithm is. Uh, so the algorithm is something called DSA, uh, which stands for Digital Signature Algorithm. Uh, this is a very old uh, kind of cryptographic algorithm uh, used for, for generating signatures. 
Uh, so I think it goes back to the 70s. Uh, maybe it's a little newer than that. Actually, it, 70s sounds wrong. I think I think it must be mu much newer than that. Uh, maybe 90s or something like that. Anyways, uh, so we have DSA. Um, this is our digital signature algorithm. And there's some math that underlies the digital signature algorithm. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about what that math is at a high level in a second when we think about what the security properties uh, we want. Um, but when digital DSA was first implemented, it was implemented in one kind of mathematical setting. So a mathematical setting means are these things integers uh, or are they other, you know, are they points on a lattice? Are they uh, coordinates of an elliptic curve? You know, there's there's a bunch of different ways of that a signature algorithm might have for, for the key elements of what a secret key is, what is a public key, what is the signature itself? How does it look mathematically and what are the rules uh, that, that govern um, govern how the math works, okay? Um, so DSA originally was proposed where all of these things were integers. Uh, they were selected from a special group of integers that had special properties. Uh, then people decided, or they, they realized that there's actually a, a way that seems at least as secure and you get really small numbers out. Uh, so, so you can shrink the size of a lot of things. So your secret key is still gonna be the same size, but your public key, instead of being like a 40, 96 bit number, uh, we can get it a lot, lot smaller. Um, and so that branch of math uh, used these things called elliptic curves. Uh, so it's just a, a special type of group. Uh, it's technically a finite field implemented uh, over elliptic curves. Um, so I'll write elliptic curves. And so uh, we end up with this variant of DC DSA that happens to be impl implemented uh, on elliptic curves. Uh, so we call it EC DSA. Okay, so this is what Bitcoin uses. Uh, and then the final thing is that uh, elliptic curves are uh, a family of curves. There's, there's lots of different curves. There's different ways of choosing curves. Uh, there's different classes of curves. Uh, some of them give you extra properties. And so the next thing you have to think about is, okay, what exact curve are you going to use? Okay. Um, and so um, in, in the case of Bitcoin, it's kind of curious. Uh, so the, the curve that they use um, is not uh, a standard curve that uh, a lot of people use. Um, so uh, where first off, where do these elliptic curves come from? So we talked about the role of NIST, uh, the National uh, Institute for Standards and Technology in the United States, and how they go around standardizing different cryptographic algorithms. And so one thing that they looked at were, uh, let's produce a set of elliptic curves that can be used for DSA and other equivalent, um, other protocols that, that are implemented uh, over these curves. And so they had a bunch of standards for, for common curves uh, that, that you might use. And curiously, uh, the designer of Bitcoin did not use one of those. Uh, so he chose Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, he chose to use uh, a slightly different curve. Uh, we don't know why, um, but, but anyways, that's, that's the case. Uh, so the curve itself, it's just a name. It doesn't really mean much to you probably. Um, but it's SecP two fifty six K one, uh, so it's a two hundred and fifty six bit security level, meaning that uh, it meets NIST definition of. Remember, NIST said that you need one hundred and twelve bits of security in order to be infeasible, and so this two hundred and fifty six is actually a reference to the secret key. How big is the secret key? So we said it was two hundred and fifty six bits. So uh, here it's uh, it's going to be uh, two hundred and fifty six bits, and if you wanted to, one attack you could do if, if I had, if you had my public key and you're trying to calculate my secret key, you could do the attack of just try every secret key, right? You can do an exhaustive search of the key space. Um, so that would take you two to the 256, which is way more than two to the 112, uh, which is what we're looking for. In fact, it's exactly uh, the square of that. Okay, so why is that? Well, it turns out that the math that underlies this key generation algorithm uh, allows you to do an attack that's even faster uh, than the exhaustive search attack. So there's a shortcut. There's a way of shortcutting uh, the exhaustive search attack. It's very closely related to the um, 
the birthday paradox, which we saw in hash functions when we looked at collision resistance, it gives you the same speed up, which we call quadratic speed up. And so if all of this means nothing to you, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I'm not going to test you on these details, but the end result is that your keys need to be twice as big as the security that they provide. So a 256-bit key gives you 128 bits of security, assuming that there's no other shortcuts that anybody finds. Okay, so that's, that's the curve uh, that's used. Now the final thing um, the signature algorithm has is uh, we're able to choose a secret key and generate a public key that we can go around saying, okay, this is our public key. Then we can go around and we can sign documents. But if I sign a document, you need to be able to verify that it was actually me, right, that signed it, right? It was actually the person who held the secret key that corresponds to this public key that signed that particular document. So we need a kind of, we'll call it a verify function. And we can think about what, what is it that we need in this verify function? Um, so what is it that we're verifying? So first off, it's not obvious, but we need a copy of the message itself because the signature is bound to the message. And what that implies is that digital signatures um, should not be confused with encryption, where in encryption, it's about taking messages and hiding them, making them confidential so that people can't read them. For a digital signature to work correctly, you need a copy of the message. You're gonna actually look and inspect uh, that message and you're going to feed it into this verify function. Okay, so signatures uh, work on messages where you know what the message is itself. Okay, so so you have a message uh, and the message is, is public. Now you can certainly encrypt something and then sign what's called the ciphertext, which is the encrypted version uh, of, of a message. So you can compose signatures and encryption together, but signatures by themselves out of the box give you no confidentiality. Okay, so we have the message, so that's great. Uh, we have the signature itself. So we're checking to see that this is a proper signature on this particular message. And we're also trying to verify that, uh, that the person who made this signature is the actual person that we think, right? So if this is Alice's signature, we wanna make sure the message didn't change. The message is exactly the same as when Alice signed it. And it was actually Alice that signed it. It wasn't Bob that signed it and is now claiming that Alice signed it. So how do we identify who Alice is? Well, we identify her based on the public key. Okay, everyone knows the public key. Um, I guess I didn't actually say public key, so I'll just quickly add that here. Okay, so we're, we're going to take the public key. So those are the three things that we take. So we take the message, uh, we take the signature on the message, and we take the public key, and we just make sure that this is the proper signature on this message by the person who holds this public key. And verify will very simply compute either true or false. Okay. Uh, why would you get a false? You would get a false either because the message got changed, right? And it can be as small as a single bit being flipped in the message that will completely ruin the signature. The signature itself could get changed. So usually you would pass along the message and then the signature would be sort of concatenated on the end. So maybe some bits of the signature got flipped. Uh, that would also ruin uh, the signature so you would get a false and the public key doesn't match uh, the secret key that was used to sign the message uh, and once again you know for any three of these components even minor modifications as small as one bit uh, can be enough uh, to, to upset it um, there's another weird attack that we'll also circle back to on bitcoin where there is a few small changes that you can make to the public key very deliberate changes where you know exactly what you're doing that would actually change uh, would change um, sort of what this looks like, um, the signature, what the signature looks like without actually making it verify false instead of true. Um, so, so anyways, I, I really need to circle back to that because it's, it's a little more involved than what I just said, but this is called transaction malleability and it, it turns up a little later in Bitcoin, but, but we'll set that aside for now. Okay, so we have our uh, three algorithms. We have a key generation algorithm, we have the actual signing algorithm, and then we have a verify uh, algorithm. Um, so let's take a break here and then we'll, we'll talk about the security properties of these algorithms.